Welcome back to another Geek Watch video. Today, my build guide of this Star Wars battle. So make sure to drop a like, rate, and subscribe. But let's blur the background and roll the intro. If you haven't seen part one where I go over the rationale behind the parts in this build, I highly recommend you see that part in the card section now and in the description below. Without any further ado, let's get straight into the build tutorial. I recommend you watch this video once through before following along for yourself. This video may be on the long side, but stick with it. I'm going to explain everything in plenty of detail. As with any build, it starts with the build prep. Static is probably something you've heard about and in my opinion isn't half the problem it used to be. To protect yourself from static, you have to ground yourself and there are two main ways to do so. You can use an anti-static wrist strap which you clip to a metal part of the case or all product links including that one in the description below. However, frequently touching the power supply is normally sufficient. You'll see me do it frequently throughout the build. Make sure you plug the PSU into the wall socket and turn the switch at the back of the power supply off and any wall switch if present on. Tools wise, all you really need is a uh, Phillips head screwdriver, however a multi-bit magnetic screwdriver is great for the annoying screws and retrieving those dropped ones in tight places. A pair of needle nose pliers is also uh, really really nice to have but I'll get to that in just a moment. Having a clear workspace is also optimal but never necessary and building outside the case is often preferred but I'll get to that in just a moment's time. The order in which people do things varies and, and which components they do it in what order, but I find the order I've adopted and evolved works the best. First, unpack the case and remove both side panels. Place these in the case box. Uh, the original box it came in sounds weird, I know, but the amount of times I've put these uh, just on the side, on the floor, on the settee, on my desk, whatever, and stood on them is astounding. They'll be safe in the box and believe you me, getting your hands on a pair of sort of second-hand case side panels is literally the hardest thing ever. Now unpack the power supply and use the four screws that look like this to screw the unit in. For this build we'll be going for a fan down orientation, however for other builds the orientation may vary. This option creates its own thermal zone for the power supply meaning it has its own supply of clean, fresh air and exhaust just its hot air not affecting the other components in the build. There we go, two parts of eight now installed, finished and done. That wasn't so hard, was it? Next is the motherboard assembly. Some may do this first, but I'll explain why you shouldn't in a moment. Unpack the motherboard from the box and place it on your workspace. You can use a mouse mat such as this as a great anti-static surface to build onto your motherboard and it won't result in any mouse mat damage. If you haven't got a mouse mat, you can use the motherboard box suffices, but whatever you do, do not place the motherboard on the anti-static bag in Cayman as it often has conductive material on the outside to dissipate static uh, from in the inside. Now grab the CPU, this case the 8370. For a full rundown of the parts hit the annotation on the CPU or use the card section now to view my full rundown of part selection at uh, part 1 that I previously referred to and when handling any CPU uh, for that matter including this one handle only by the edges and be careful not to touch the pins as these are very very sensitive. Now my build order starts to become much more logical as you should ground yourself by simply touching the outer PSU casing. Now pull outward and up on the CPU retention arm on the socket on the motherboard and you should see the socket move very slightly. Now we'll be seeding the CPU. AMD as of this video uses ZIF socket standing for zero in insertion force. Align the golden triangle on the CPU with that of the plastic triangle on the motherboard socket. Place the CPU in the socket and the pin should drop right into the holes. AMD ZIF socket uh, means no insertion force is necessary. It's all in the name, no pressure, no force. If you're applying pressure or force, something isn't quite right. So head back 30 seconds. Now the CPU's in its RAM time. For this build I'll be using 1.8GB DIMM of Corsair Vengeance low profile memory. I had to go for low profile as 
as I stated in part one uh, due to the, the height clearance with the CPU cooler. Different motherboards like RAM in different slots but a simple rule for four DIMMs fill all the slots. For two it's every other slot often colour coded and for one you'll need to refer to the manual but often using any slot will work just fine. For this config use the slot displayed or the furthest to the left. Install the RAM and pull back uh, the, uh, the, little, the little clips. In this case it's white and you only have to do one on this motherboard uh, due to the fact it's much higher end. The quantity does vary though on a vendor to vendor basis. Find the notch on the RAM matching it up with the one on the motherboard as you'll have uh, one side of the RAM is slightly longer or slot wise than the other side. Apply even pressure on each side of the RAM dim uh, using your two thumbs. You'll need to use both hands for this and you'll hear a reassuring click sound. The clip should automatically clip back down and whilst RAM requires some pressure it should never be forced. We're halfway now is the most frustrating component and this one's a bugger. The CPU cooler. For this config, make sure the appropriate mounting hardware is in for the AMD AM3 Plus socket and screw the black plate in. Now continue to follow the instructions in order to complete the installation and yes, you will have to give your manly I don't need a manual attitude and consult the manual. Well, you don't have to, but if you want your CPU to be so hot it could cook bacon, I would consult the manual, although bacon is nice. Orientation of the CPU cooler is your choice, however I'd recommend this config for optimal airflow, pulling fresh air in from the front intake, through the, the heatsink on the cooler and out the back of the case to never be seen again. Many cases, including this one, the Fantex N2 Pro, allow backplate installation for the CPU cooler when the motherboard is already installed. But trust me, doing it outside the case is way, way easier. Now we're all screwed and clipped in and hooked and blah, 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 and we're all ready to sort some cabling out. Get the CPU cable from the, uh, the CPU cooler and connect it to the 4-pin PWM fan header labelled CPU fan header on the motherboard and you're ready to crack on. Some people would, at this point, plug in the GPU and the PSU, short the pins on the motherboard in order to test if the system posts and all the hardware is in order, however I don't. So yeah, basically I just talked really fast so you didn't listen to any of that. Call this pure irresponsible or lazy that I don't test the system outside of the case, but I've never had any hardware DOAs or dead on arrival parts, so for now I'll save time and skip this kind of unnecessary step. Since we're halfway, I'm going to take 10 seconds of your time to tell you about G2A. Use my referral link g2a.com forward slash r forward slash geekawatt, the first in the description below, also on your screen now, to get great games at great prices on Steam, Origin, Uplay, and um, even the uh, <coughs> consoles. Plus, it supports me, especially if you have that pesky ad block enabled. I get a slight kickback when you buy and you get cheap games, so it's a win-win situation. If you'd like to be the real MVP, you can even donate using the link on screen. Also, the second link in the description below and donations, uh, whilst incredibly appreciated, are never required. Anyway, since I can't count to 10 seconds, let's get back to the tutorial. Now it's time to move that motherboard assembly from outside of the case inside to the case. I had some difficulty with this specific CPU cooler, although it is a great budget option, the Hyper 212 Evo, and ended up having to tinker a bit inside the case. Once again, more my human error uh, than that of the Hyper 212 Evo, and it really was a great CPU cooler, but watch part one for part rationale. Now, to put the motherboard in the case, you need to check that your, your case has the standoffs uh, inside in the right places. Many cases, including this, come with standoffs pre-installed, and these prevent your motherboard from uh, basically grounding out on uh, the motherboard tray. Uh, but a quick check is always a smart idea, idea even if the standoffs are already installed. So hover the motherboard over the area and identify if there's a brass standoff under each hole in the motherboard. And if not, screw one in. You can get specialised tools for this, but a pair of needle nose pliers will suffice. And that's what I meant about the needle nose pliers previously in this video. Now the most irritating step if you forget it, the IO shield. Grab it from inside your motherboard box and this one from Azus has fancy colour labels and cushioning. General rules of thumb regarding installation are as follows, uh, writing needs to be read from the exterior as that is where you're plugging things in and the audio ports on the shields tend to be towards the bottom, closest to the PCIe lanes on the motherboard and furthest away from the uh, at the top of the motherboard where you get your 4 plus 4 pin uh, CPU power and your CPU socket. If you're still confused, the bloody ports on the motherboard have to go through it, so just line it up and do a test fit. Getting the iShow IO shield in can be uh, a bit irritating, uh, but it's nothing complex. Clip the four corners in and be careful as the metal can be sharp and you don't want to cut yourself. Now we're actually going to move to the motherboard into the case. Try and hold the motherboard by the metal heat sinks and not on anything on the backside or the bottom as this will make things unnecessarily hard for yourself. 
Get the ports through the IO shield to begin with, and some cases, sadly not this one, although it is superb, have a post uh, where basically one of the standoffs would normally go in, uh, but instead it's got a, like a little post uh, which keeps the motherboard nice and secure while you screw it in. This case doesn't have it, as I said, and for the cases that don't, uh, basically make sure you hold your motherboard through the IO shield to keep the brass standoffs perfectly aligned with the holes and screw one of the uh, one of the motherboard screws that looks just like this uh, down through the holes and you're good to go. That will keep it nice and firmly in place. Now screw in and tighten all of the motherboard screws in a cross pattern ideally uh, to make sure your motherboard goes in nice and straight and you're not getting any significant strain. Now we've already installed the CPU, CPU cooler, RAM, motherboard, power supply and the case. See that was much faster than you thought right? No. Oh, okay then. Now for storage. This build uses an SSD and a hard drive. For SSDs, screw in the SSD from the bottom of the sled in these screw holes using these screws. You can use the tallest bays if you like, but for ease of running the SATA power cable and only having to use one harness, I recommend using the average 3.5 inch drive sled bay as it has mounting hardware uh, and mounting slots for the 2.5 inch SSDs and there are 6 of them after all, so you know, plenty left. Plus the added airflow here is good for the drive, especially when under high load. Hard drive insulation in this case is so so easy. Simply grab a sled and open out the wings per se on the sides, slot the drive in and close the wings up and that's it. Now for some cable management. Azus motherboards come with this block thingy which basically makes your front panel connectors super easy to install. If your motherboard doesn't or you're confused then refer to the manual but grab the power, reset and hard drive LED indicators positive and negative and hook them up to the appropriate positive and negative connectors on this block connector. Shove that into the motherboard and your front panel connectors are all done. The Fantex N3 Pro, the case we're using that I haven't shut up about yet, comes beautifully pre-cable managed, so you'll find the connectors behind the motherboard tray for USB 2 and USB 3. USB is easy to hook up. The USB 3 is the big blue and its notch so will only go in one way. The pins in this can be quite sensitive, so do be careful, but don't force it in. It only goes one way, as I said, and it's nice and simple. The biggest front panel connector on the motherboard. USB 2 is also super easy, and some cases only have USB 3, so this step might not be necessary but thankfully the Fantex N3 Pro has USB 2 and USB 3 which is great for compatibility reasons. It's a rectangular black connector this one here and has one of the pin holes knocked out so we'll only go in one way once again no force necessary whatsoever. That's all the pesky front panel connectors out the way and done now for the cable management. The stuff from the power supply. Run the 20 plus 4 pin connector behind the motherboard tray and through the rubber grommet nearest the connector and run the 4 plus 4 pin cable behind the motherboard tray and up diagonally to the top left corner and through the hole. The 20 plus 4 pin connector is the largest out of all of them and it's super super wide. The 4 plus 4 pin is just literally 4 pins and 4 pins, they're both identical and go in the top left of the motherboard. Some cases may need to do this before motherboard installation as the 4 plus 4 pin cable cutout uh, is often underneath the motherboard but this this case doesn't so woo connect both four pin connectors up as with the 20 plus four pin motherboard connector uh, they may need some pressure and they only go in one way they will clip in over a notch so don't try and force them back out uh, you will need to use the latching mechanism to get them back out. Now for GPU or graphics card installation. Push back the notch on the top PCIe slot uh, shown here and remove the two PCIe covers uh, from the left hand side of the case. Keep the screws from this, they look like thumb screws but you will need a screwdriver to untighten them unless you are incredible at untightening thumb screws. You'll need these in a sec so put them to the side and do not lose them. The case does however come with spares in the very very nice toolkit uh, which I have mentioned in my review of this case. Grab the GPU and slot it in, fans facing towards the power supply downwards and away from the CPU socket. Uh, this graphics card has a back plate which is glorious, so uh, that's facing up towards the CPU socket. Once it's in, grab the two screws you used to remove the PCIe slot covers and screw the GPU in. You may want to hold it upwards when screwing these in, else you're screwing in a saggy card from the outset. Graphics cards are heavy and the, uh, the back plate on the back does try and prevent sagging, uh, but just help yourself from the beginning by having it nice and pushed up. Now for the last bit of cabling. Grab two SATA data cables for the drives that look like this and plug into the drives and the motherboard. Now grab a SATA power cable and plug the drives in. These cables won't click uh, so some pressure is needed, it does go right in. Now for GPU power. Grab the dual 6 pin power cable from the PSU and run it behind the motherboard and out at the grommet closest to the GPU. Shove these in as you did with the 4 plus 4 pin CPU and 20 plus 4 pin motherboard power connector. And breathe. 
Screw the slide panel back in and that is it. You are there. So now what do you need? Windows and some games. Head to g2a.com forward slash art forward slash geekwatt for great deals on uh, which both support me and allow you to get some really, really cheap games and great deals to get you started. The first link in the description below. If you want to go even further, you can be the real legend, a real MVP and donate using the link on screen now and the second in the description below. It's never required but helps so much and is incredibly appreciated with all money uh, being pumped right back into the channel. For more videos, Videos such as these. I hope you enjoyed the video and urge you to subscribe for more content like this. A like rating is also massively appreciated to bump this video up in search and a follow on Twitter shouldn't go amiss for an insight into my daily personal life related shenanigans. Thank you very much for watching, have a great day and I'll see you as always in the next Geekawa video.